My name is Dennis Wentz. I am a, a new postdoctoral uh, research fellow at the University of Washington School of Medicine. I work um, primarily in the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institute, uh, which is uh, part of the Pacific Northwest node of the CTN. And my uh, advisor is uh, Dennis Donovan, who is the uh, co-director of the Pacific Northwest node. I'm very um, happy to be with everyone today. I'm also a little nervous about this presentation being fairly new to the CTN, so I hope that what I bring is beneficial, and maybe even so as sort of an insider-outsider, as someone who is, who is newer to the CTN and is presenting some, some ideas and research from, from clinics that are outside of the CTN as well, and I hope that that can be beneficial um, to, to everyone here. I'm just going to go through um, real quickly the, the learning objectives. Um, you can see here, to, to be able to describe some, some reasons for what I call a treatment modality mismatch between substance use disorder research and real world practice, identify uh, at least a couple of clinical resources for using evidence-based treatments in group format, and to explain at least two facilitators and two barriers for using evidence-based treatment in group format. We'll go ahead and, and, uh, and begin. As many as, as, as probably everyone here knows and is quite aware of, there's several evidence-based treatments that have been developed for substance use disorders, things such as cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy, 12-step facilitation, community reinforcement approach, contingency management, behavioral couples therapy, and, and others. And there's been a lot of important progress in the last 15 years or so in that regard. Uh, on the other hand, there is a, a wide research practice gap that persists, as I'm sure most people here are, are aware of in the CTN. Um, things like organizational barriers, the complexity of uh, providing comprehensive recovery-oriented or services for, chronic frequently, for a chronic frequently relapsing condition, the difficulty of balancing treatment fidelity with individualized care. So what, what I'm um, framing here is what I call a treatment modality mismatch. Whereas the majority of, of practice is in, for substance use disorders is, is in group therapy. There's some estimates that say that about 90% of clinics use mostly group therapy. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot we don't know about what actually happens in the real world, especially outside of the CTN. But what we do know and all the best reports suggest that group therapy is predominant in, in a substance use treatment setting. Um, these, these can be several different kinds of groups, such as psychoeducational groups, skill-based, skill development groups, uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy groups, support groups, or, and specialty groups. On the other hand, the majority of research and research efforts have focused on individual therapy, and sometimes with the assumption that individual therapy is normative. Um, I'm going to give a, talk about a couple of, of exceptions to that before I go on further, in that there has been, first of all, a, a nice met, uh, meta-analysis on group therapy effectiveness for substance use disorders that was done by, by Weiss et al. in 2004 um, that showed that groups are generally as effective as individual therapy with no significant differences between types of groups. It's important to keep in mind, though, that that's a general comparison without that, that is just kind of looking overall what's the difference between group therapy and individual therapy according to the research studies that have been done. So there has been research taking a look at this for substance use disorder in, in general, um, but very little in terms of d designing of clinical trials or specific experimental evidence in terms of, uh, of specific group therapies. There are some exceptions to that that I'm aware of. There may be some others as well. Um, a few that I, I have noted here is, is the seeking safety uh, comorbid treatment for substance use and, and uh, trauma, which was actually designed for both individual or group use, and there is evidence for effectiveness of both, including open groups. That's been um, assessed also in one of the CTN trials. Uh, stimulant abuser groups to engage in 12 steps. Um, uh, another CTN trial was actually designed and, and assessed for open enrolling groups. Um, so that's a 12-step oriented group for, for stimulant users. And then also uh, a newer um, intervention, mindfulness-based relapse prevention, has been designed for groups and, and evaluated for groups at the outset. So there, there's, there, I think there is some, some movement towards um, 
thinking about clinical trials, thinking about um, research approaches that, that begin with groups in mind. But overall, the, the, the predominant focus in, in research has been with individual therapy. And there's, some, there's, a, and there's a lot of problems with that. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to outline a few of them here and, and we're gonna continue to address this throughout the presentation. So in general, existing evidence-based treatments do not adequately, adequately address complexities for group therapy. That's not to say that they, that they might not through a certain adaptation or through certain kinds of training, but if you just take your average clinician, a lot of the existing evidence-based treatments or existing manuals are not going to adequ adequately address a lot of things, such as the greater unpredictability of groups, the need for greater clinician flexibility and skills. An important point that I'd like to underscore is that evidence-based group facilitation skills do not automatically transfer from individual treatment experience. We could be talking about very different animals here. And one thing in particular that I'd like to underscore is the difference between what I frame as the group as therapy or as treatment and the group as vehicle. And I think this is a very important distinction in that a lot of times so-called groups that we, we talk about are, um, are, are a way to bring a lot of individual clients through the door and not necessarily using the group as therapeutic in its own right. Um, and there, there are many group therapy principles um, that, that we could look at in terms of that, such as the benefits of peer support and modeling, um, decreasing stigma through, through being among others with similar problems, increased accountability, um, corrective feedback for interpersonal problems, instilling hope by seeing the successes of others. There's, there's many benefits of group therapy in its own right beyond the benefit that many of us are well aware of in terms of efficiency and cost, keeping the seats warm and keeping the clinics open, and, and in a sense, by having people continually coming through. Um, so that's the one thing to maybe think about, I think, in terms of, in terms of your own clinical work or your own research is in terms of how you're, you're framing group therapy. Is it something that you're framing as simply a vehicle to get people through or something that's therapeutic in its own right? Um, another um, complexity here is, is just this tension here between the individual and, and, and the group. And it can be very difficult in taking treatments that are designed for individuals and making that work in a group. And one thing that frequently happens is what I would call ser serial individual therapy, in which you know the therapist is essentially working with one client at a time rather than with a group more holistically. And then a, a final complexity, which is a huge one, is that most groups are open and rolling. Um, this is actually this. Um, statistic here is actually based on a survey I did as part of my dissertation research, a survey of substance use disorder group therapists in the U.S., in which 69% said they facilitate only open enrolling groups. Um, just in case um, others aren't familiar about what that means, an open enrolling group would be where members can be added on an ongoing basis um, rather than starting all at the same time and ending all at the same time. There's a lot of reasons, I think, for why open enrolling groups are so prominent. Um, popular, I think, particularly to, to keep, uh, keep the groups going and to keep, the, keep clinics even in business sometimes. These are particularly um, popular in um, inpatient and intensive outpatient programs as well. Um, open, open enrolling groups pose a lot of challenges, but one in particular when we're thinking about using evidence-based treatments or even more structured therapy generally is that it can be difficult for a treatment that requires a lot of progressive content in which one session would build on another if you have new people coming in all of the time. And that's a challenge that I don't think we have even remotely um, adequately um, reckoned with in thinking about the um, intersection between research and practice when it comes to evidence-based treatment. Uh, Dennis, um, Dawn yeah. Sugarman wanted to add uh, two other types of evidence-based group treatments. One integrated group therapy for bipolar disorder and substance abuse and with Roger Weiss, and then the women's recovery group for women with SUD, Shelly Greenfield. Are you familiar Great. with those? I actually am not, so this is good for me, and that's more stuff I can check out. That, and that's, that's actually, I, and, I, and I hope, too, that uh, you know, when we um, get to the end and have a conversation, that any things that are, that are gaps that are filled out, or, or that, that we can fill those out together, because I think that this is an area that hasn't really been adequately fleshed out. So thank you for that. 
Um, moving on to the next slide here, you, I have a, a picture here that kind of, I think, just characterizes the, the dilemma that, that we're in. The, the, the couch here represents uh, the, uh, an, an, a research-based intervention. It's, it's very nice. It looks pretty. There's a shiny bow on it. We could, we could say all these wonderful things about it. Um, this, this would exemplify, I think, many of the individual therapies that are um, evidence-based treatments. But if it doesn't fit in the room, we've got a problem. And the room, meaning the infrastructure in which group therapy is done, which generally necessitates these open enrolling groups, just simply the couch doesn't fit. So what are our options here? We can either use the couch in a way that it wasn't intended, either slanted as it's shown in the picture, or we could cut it in two, right? We could, I guess, expand the room, right? I suppose that's an option, but probably not a luxury that is very um, likely, that we're very likely going to have. And that certainly when we think about the treatment infrastructure right now in the United States with funding, it's hard to imagine it changing anytime soon. That we will continue to rely on, on um, treatment facilities that use predominantly group therapies. And even if with the shift for more primary care, if part of the goal is with something like screening and brief intervention, part of that goal is referral to treatment. In other words, specialty care, I assume, is going to stick around. And unless there's some major change, group therapy is going to be a huge part of it. Um, finally, the, our last option would be we get rid of it or we don't use it. And so what I'm suggesting here um, in terms of that's going to kind of set the stage for, for the next uh, part of my um, discussion is just the importance of basically measuring the room before we bring home the fancy couch. Well, what, what, is, what, are, the, the, what are the barriers? What are the constraints? What are the infrastructure that, of, the, of the treatment settings in which we work? and to begin more from the bottom up in thinking about treatment. And I know that the, the CTN is um, playing a role in, in terms of that. Um, here's a, a quote here from Elizabeth Wells in, in her, uh, I think, 10-year review of the Clinical Trials Network. If we are truly to improve drug abuse treatment in the nation, we must better understand what is going on in specific types of programs and how the introduction of new treatment methods interacts with patient, provider, and program characteristics. What I'm going to um, spend a little bit of time um, describing here is, is basically trying to describe a little bit more what is going on in terms of group facilitation. Um, so I'm going to be, be discussing, in particular, some facilitators and barriers of group facilitation based on my research exploring the use of group therapy among substance use disorder specialty clinicians. And then after that, uh, I'll discuss of some recommendations and resources for researchers and clinicians. I, I want to emphasize that I'm coming at this with a fair dose of humility. I, I don't feel like I have you know, these bulletproof solutions or strategies. I hope we can have a conversation that's beneficial for, for all of us here. But I do have some ideas, and, I, and that can hopefully be a springboard in terms of thinking strategically or, or ways that may be helpful for both researchers and clinicians. So just to give a quick overview, I'm not going to get too much under the hood here, but just to give a quick overview of, of, of this uh, study that was part of my dissertation, this is just a portion of it that I'm presenting just a few snippets from really here. Um, part of this was based on interviews with clinical directors and clinicians at local substance use disorder specialty clinics. These were all in the same um, region. And, um, the aim of this was to document organizational and clinical complexities that may impact the utilization of group evidence-based treatment. Now, I want to be clear here that not all of the um, clinics that I was working with actually used what I would consider to be evidence-based treatment. But part of the, the um, role here was to basically talk with clinicians about what would be the um, barriers if they were indeed to use an evidence-based treatment or at least some kind of more structured or manualized treatment. How would that work with, um, with the infrastructures of their, of their clinic? Um, this is with three local um, diverse clinics. None of these are CTN clinics. Just want to make that clear. Um, one was a private uh, nonprofit community clinic, a heavily 12-step oriented um, clinic. Um, the second is a state university-owned community clinic. It was pretty eclectic, a fair mix of 12-step and behavioral approaches. And the final one was a VA intensive outpatient clinic. This final clinic was actually 
pretty aggressively trying to um, bring evidence-based treatments into its um, entirely open enrolling group therapy protocol. Um, it, it, it would in, include uh, CBT, 12-step facilitation, motivational interviewing, um, a whole um, range of things and trying to make that happen with a lot of struggle, actually, and that's part of you know what I'll be presenting on. The participants were three clinical directors and 13 clinicians. Um, so what I'm going to describe here um, is based on a, a semi-structured interview. Um, I asked all participants about the clinic's mission, treatment philosophies and goals, its strengths and weaknesses, and most importantly and in most depth, its group therapy curriculum. I also um, talked with clinical directors in addition about the clinic's history, providers, clients, and practices. Um, just a little bit about analysis, what I'm about to present was based on a qualitative thematic content analysis. I'm not going to go into detail here about how that was done, but it, it uh, involves coding of, of the organizational structure of group therapies. It involved an assessment of the potential or actual ability to utilize EBTs based on prominent evidence-based treatment manuals, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, 12-step facilitation, and motivational enhancement therapies using the manuals from Project Match, and then a thematic analysis of clinician interviews. So this next slide that I'm about to, to show may seem a little scary. We'll go over it, so don't, um, don't uh, freak out too much. Um, what, I'm, what I'm showing here is a table showing how well each of the clinics in organizational structure mapped onto these three evidence-based treatment manuals, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy, and 12-step facilitation. So you see here the three, the rows for each of the three therapies. And then this first portion was for the first clinic. I have, these are pseudonyms of the clinic name. This is the community 12-step clinic. The second one is the state university hospital one. And the third one is the VA intensive outpatient clinic. And what I have here is just a description of, of different parts of the structure of the organizational structure, the treatment modality, group enrollment, group session length, and treatment structure. And I have that for each set here. And what you can see here is the different colors. The red basically shows a strong mismatch between that aspect of the EBT and the organ between the EBT and that aspect of the organizational structure. The yellow a moderate mismatch and a green and green a, a general match. And as you can see, there's a lot of red and a lot of yellow and very little green. So just to, to show um, uh, an example, I'm probably not going to go through this whole thing here right now. But um, this first clinic, for example, its treatment modality was only in groups, groups only, whereas each of these three therapies, at least the project match ones, were designed only for individuals. You can see the same thing here for this clinic. This clinic here did have some individual therapy available, and that's why I coded it yellow here to show that there, there, there's a moderate mismatch. The group enrollment for all three of these was only open enrolling groups. There were no closed groups, which posed a problem for each of these therapies. Less so for the cognitive behavioral therapy and the 12-step facilitation, and that there was some flexibility in the session order. But for the motivational enhancement therapy, at least the project match version, this is a highly individualized uh, progressive uh, curriculum. It would make it very difficult to pull off in an open enrolling group. Uh, the group session links, um, you can get a sense of just how they um, connected with what um, the manual specified. Less problem there overall, but there would need to be some adaptation. And then finally, the treatment structure, which is, a, I, I think, another point that's not thought about enough, that these clinics often have a treatment structure that they may have certain restraints or for certain reasons that they use. It might even have to do in connection with like uh, court referrals and all, all kinds of things. So you can see here that in general, the treatment structures of these clinic, clinics didn't map, map on well with doing, say, 12 standalone sessions or four standalone sessions. Generally, these treatments were also using a suite of treatments, right, which also just ask questions like, are, are these therapies meant to be used in a suite of treatments? They weren't necessarily assessed for that, right? So there's all kinds of questions here that if we were just imagining clinicians being handed these manuals and being asked to, to go, they'd have a lot of struggle to make it, to make it work at least 
certainly in the, in the way that the manuals were intended. But even if they were to try to be savvy and adapt them in ways that worked well, there could be a lot of, a lot of uh, struggles with that. I'm going to go through now some of the, um, some of the uh, participants, the clinicians' um, comments about this. I'm going to be talking about some, some themes based on my analysis of some of the, of, of how the clinicians use group therapy and some of the struggles that they had. The first theme I, I want to talk about, um, not so much a, a, a barrier per se, but clinicians really emphasized the importance of individualized treatment, even when they were talking about group therapy. This common adage of meeting clients where they are at was endorsed by everyone that I interviewed without me even asking for it, usually verbatim. So there's a strong pull to, to meet clients where they are at, to provide individualized treatment. Um, even when the only treatment that, may, that they may be getting is group therapy. And one way that um, clinicians talked about this is that client engagement was a major indicator of successfully meeting clients in group format. Um, engagement in terms of what was often in, at least informally assessed by whether clients were going out of the, were leaving the, the group excited, whether they were talking about it with the other group members as they were leaving, whether they mentioned that that was something that was helpful or that they would use, whether they were simply staying awake and not falling asleep. But there was a great challenge in terms of doing this and, and in facilitating client engagement in terms of clients with varying levels of engagement and readiness to change. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Sorry, one second. The, the major theme, though, that I wanted to, to, to talk about here was, is the necessity of flexibility. This was underscored in great depth and with often very forceful emphasis by all of the clinicians that I interviewed in terms of just how important it was to be flexible, particularly with group therapy. Um, at some level, flexibility was already embedded into the clinic or the clinician's existing group practices. Just a couple of very common things, having a check-in at the beginning of each session. Um, and some clinicians often varied at how long they would allow this check-in to be, how willing they'd be to deviate if someone had particular problems. But at any rate, this is something that just about every clinician talked about they, they wanted to be able to do, was to check in and have people um, give a sense about how they've been doing. Another way that flexibility might be built in is introducing new members in open groups and just continually having a process in which they're going to be ready to do that. That may, al may also involve um, giving at least a, a review of the group norms or group rules at the beginning of every group as well, as in an open group that might be necessary. Flexibility was especially emphasized by clinicians in terms of using manualized therapies. Um, there's a, I have a few quotes that I'm going to um, uh, share here. This is one by Becky. This is a, a pseudonym. Um, meeting people where they are at and meeting the needs of the group, I think, sometimes is compromised by doing manualized therapy. There is a middle ground between being some fluffy therapist who just does everything by their gut and being a hardened, manualized, you have to stick to the manual. And this was a, a, a tension that was, I think, universally shared by the, by the clinician, wanting to have this middle ground where they could have uh, enough flexibility, particularly with a group, and having some sort of structure. A couple other um, quotes that were used by other participants was being able to do my little twists and turns or putting my own spin on things. I, I think the clinicians vary quite a bit in terms of how far that spin can go and how far those twists and turns might, might be and in some ways that might make some of us a little uncomfortable perhaps in terms of maybe thinking of treatment fidelity. But the, the bottom line being that there has to be some room for that. Um, this was emphasized so strongly that um, what I would ask clinicians, for example, if they were told to do a very structured, say, cognitive behavioral therapy manual. And the response that I got from several was, you'd have my two weeks notice, right? I'm, I'm simply not doing that. On the other hand, when clinicians were offered a hypothetical by me about continuing to do basically what they're doing, but having, say, a 30-minute 
miniature, very structured cognitive behavioral therapy approach within a 90-minute group session. People were actually pretty excited about that. They're like, yeah, I, I, I could actually see that being helpful, right? And so I think that that's an important point in terms of my, my research here is that it can be easy to see clinicians as being really aversive to structure, really aversive to evidence-based treatments or, or, or manuals or whatever it may be. And I think that, that's, that the truth is more in the details, that many clinicians actually welcome something structured and something manualized. They just also emphasize the importance of them having flexibility. The, another part of this was the importance of adaptations or accommodations being necessary to meet clients where they are at. Um, this could be both things that are done in advance of the group, maybe based on what you know about the group composition, or accommodations on the fly. And, and here's a quote here by Rosemary describing an accommodation on the fly. I may have a plan in my mind and then I gauge it on the group and their level of how alert they are and awake. If it is a rainy, gloomy day like this, I would not show a video. I might stand up and do an interactive lecture. So it really is based on the group and their level of functioning. And will this engage them or will this put them asleep today? And this is, this is a really interesting quote that, that exemplifies what, what many clinicians share in that a common thing is that people would kind of size up the group, right? They're not just meeting clients where they're at, but they're meeting, trying to meet groups where they're at. And this, this raises a lot of questions in terms of, you know, how well can, can one do that, right? And, 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 I, and I had my own worries about clinicians who would just be very prone to, to deviate from what they had planned based on what might be a, a, an erroneous heuristic of, of the group. But on the other hand, it does raise questions about, you know, when, when should a clinician have a sense of the group being needing some sort of adaptation or, or accommodation? And you can imagine the complexity in making those decisions would be quite a bit greater than just dealing with an individual client. Flexibility was also emphasized in terms of needing to address complex group dynamics. Um, quote here by Alex. Sometimes there is a guy that's been in the Friday group that tends to kind of go off on weird tangents, and so I'll have to kind of, okay, okay, thanks, let's get somebody else's input. Not that it's not important, but I can kind of see people zoning out. This is something that was r routinely um, talked about in terms of concerns about um, m m monopolizers in the group versus others who aren't sharing, right, in, in terms of how, how to basically help uh, manage those group dynamics. And you can imagine that being very difficult, say, if you're really tethered to a very structured curriculum and you have somebody who's really trying to monopolize the group, right? So that, that's a, another you know, major aspect that can be quite a bit more complex in group therapy than in, than in individual therapy. Okay, I'm about to show another crazy slide here. This is a, 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 what's called a concept map. And what I've done here is basically try to map out conceptually the clinicians who I talk to, the various themes surrounding flexibility with group facilitation. I'm not going to go through all of this right here, and it's kind of overwhelming. The, the, over, the, the major point here is just to emphasize the complexity of flexible group facilitation and, and complexities that can really have an impact in terms of this thing we might call evidence-based practice, right? Um, a few things is that flexibility requires multiple treatment approaches from these clinicians' perspective. It's reflected by commonly reported group structures, such as check-in groups or check-ins, which may be used to accommodate open groups in some cases. Flexibility is, is enhanced by adjunctive individual care. Um, you, you may be able to um, adapt things somewhat by having um, individual care, or you, it might be okay to have maybe more standard groups if more flexibility is happening in adjunctive individual care. It may require accommodations and adaptations, as we talked about, which may complicate the use of manualized therapies and structured plans. Flexibility is also essential, at least from the client's, clinician's perspective, when it, in even using a manualized therapy or a structured plan in the first place. And the rigid use of that plan could impair group engagement and cohesion. So that group engagement and cohesion or flexibility is needed to promote that group engagement and cohesion, right? So this gives an overall of, the, of some of the dynamics here. The next slide 
even goes into that even a little more in terms of uh, the complex group dynamics. Um, I've talked about this just a little bit, but how there can be varying levels or types of engagement that monopolizing clients, quiet or withdrawn clients, disruptive or aggressive clients, intoxicated or sleeping clients, and how that um, can can affect and complicate um, uh, flexibility would be needed to address those, those complexities. Also varying levels of, of readiness to change, such as varying levels of motivation and severity. That can also complicate the use of something like motivational interviewing in a group. So um, I realize there's, there's a lot there, but I'm going to go on um, for now. Um, a few other things that I wanted to just address briefly, I could talk about each of these for a long time, but um, some other uh, clinician and organizational challenges and barriers. The first was limited clinician experience and organizational training. Now, perhaps this differs in, in some of the CTN clinics. I'm, I'm sure it may to some, to some extent. But in general, clinicians reported feeling very unprepared in doing group therapy, at least when they began. Um, a common story was I barely touched on it in my, in my um, educational um, training. And then I got to the clinic, and I was basically thrown into a group. Or I was you, there was kind of the, the classic medical training, uh, see, one, see one, do one, teach one approach, right? And that may make some sense at some level. However, if what the clinician is seeing is not very good in the first place, then there could be a problem. And, and in, in addition to that, there was very limit, limited attention to just quality of, of any kind um, in terms of just what is the quality of these groups. In general, there might have been maybe the supervisor sat in now and then, but very little in terms of structured approaches to that. And my sense is that that's pretty normative with the field. Um, a second point here, limited attention to clients' demographic diversity. Um, there was very little in terms of groups that were um, trying to address at some levels racial, ethnic, cultural, gender diversity. Um, the most that these groups got in, that, in terms of that was basically um, encouraging uh, clients to avoid racist or sexist remarks, right? So there's a kind of communicative um, uh, political correctness that was, that's embedded in these groups. But in terms of actually engaging maybe more sociocultural aspects that relate to diversity, that was virtually absent. And finally, a predominance of psychoeducation. In um, a survey that is part of my dissertation, which I'm not reporting here, about half of uh, group clinicians reported that about, or clinicians reported that about half of their groups were psychoeducational groups. And this, this could, be, could be worrisome in that psychoeducational groups, based on um, some, some research, are near the bottom of the evidence-based hierarchy for substance use disorders. Um, I, I think that it makes sense that, that they're used so frequently and that they're probably easier to do. Um, they require less maybe management of group dynamics. It's easier to lecture than it is to, to have a, a therapy group. But, but the, the, research, the evidence that we do have, which is limited, suggests that they're not, they're not too great in terms of the evidence and the skills-based approaches are, are, are a better way to go. Um, one common thing that, um, that clinicians talked about was, or, or clinicians often talked about their groups as classes. And I, this was my experience also, and certainly my clinical experience as well, in that these groups are often called classes by both clinicians and clients, which may be a little revealing of, of what may be happening in them. So I'm going I'm to move on to some, some recommendations here. And this is really just to open a conversation. I don't, and these are humble recommendations. I have some for researchers. I have some for clinicians. I'm going to then talk about some recommended resources briefly. And then hopefully we'll have a time, some time to have a conversation together that at the very least might be helpful for me. I hope for you as well. Um, so recommendations for researchers. First. I would like to see researchers more being uh, more frequently assuming that open enrolling groups are the default specialty treatment modality. So often I'm in presentations or I read manuscripts that talk about treatment that don't even address this, right? It's just this sense that we're talking about substance abuse treatment. 
right? And, and oftentimes, that's being done with the assumption that individual therapy is normative. And that just ain't the truth. It's open enrolling group therapies that are the normative specialty treatment modality um, in, in this field. And so, at the very least, we ought to be clear what we're talking about. Um, it, whether it's individual or group, and then if it's group, is it open enrolling, is it closed, right? Those, those details, I think, matter. Um, I would like to see that more also in terms of assuming that default at the very beginning of, 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 of uh, research design, right? And, and, and I think it makes sense to maybe do that and then adapt to individual therapy, right? It would be interesting to think about kind of flipping things around rather than the status quo in which, which the opposite is the case. Um, creating and adapting treatments that can be more flexibly used. Um, allowing for a mix of structure and free freedom. There's been some really um, great implementation science research on this recently that really underscores the importance of flexibility. When, when the, the evidence-based treatments that can be more flexibly used are much more likely to, um, to uh, be, be used in the long run by, um, by clinicians. Um, uh, Lawrence Palinkis, uh, an implementation science researcher, has done a fair bit of work on this. Greater incorporation of group as therapy rather than group as vehicle processes, as I mentioned, you know, earlier. And um, in terms of um, thinking of ways in which the group itself is curative rather than simply a vehicle for maybe um, transporting a, a CBT curriculum, let's say. Uh, creation of group-specific products as part of clinical trials. So even if this is maybe an individual clinical trial that's being done, well, why not, as part of that effort, do an adaptation, do an adapted manual for open groups? Even if that manual has not been assessed for open groups, that's how it's going to be used. So it, we might actually help out clinicians by, by doing that or, or, or coordinating with them in terms of that. I kind of already mentioned this one, addressing the application to, to open groups and publications, manuals, resources, et cetera, whenever possible. I'm really tired of seeing the list of evidence-based treatments for substance use disorder that don't differentiate between individual and group therapy, as though it just doesn't matter. Um, clarifying and reviews of evidence-based treatments, this is, I guess, what I just talked about, whether treatments have been adapted or assessed for groups. One thing that I've you know, been just toying with is it would be really nice to think of maybe a clinical trial of a group therapy training program, right, in which, in which uh, clinicians are randomized to get therapy and at least basic group therapy facilitation skills. And then to see what the differences might be for, for a, a group therapy protocol that might be assessed. I think that could be actually pretty compelling. I could see, for example, the VA, which is, does tons of groups throughout their entire mental health system, but as far as I know, does not have any group therapy quality control or rollout. Um, that this could be actually really, really beneficial to see what, um, what, what we might be able to do in, in improving treatment. We really have not taken much of a look in that black box of group therapy as usual, and this can help to at least improve that. And I'd be open to hearing other ideas that others may have. Um, and then some uh, recommendations for clinicians and clinic directors. Again, coming back to this distinction between group as uh, as vehicle and group at versus group as, as therapy. To be thinking about group therapy as a distinctive modality and, and to consult treatment materials designed for groups. So, and I'll, I'll mention a few things here in a, in a minute. Um, provide or even require specialized training and quality control for group therapy. Don't assume that because somebody has the CBT manual and they're doing groups that it's necessarily good group therapy. Um, Developing clear guidelines about when and how to deviate from session agendas. I think that it's pretty clear that in group therapy, there, there needs to be quite a bit of, uh, of flexibility. There needs to be room to deviate from, from agendas. But it may be helpful for a, a clinic to be very clear about when those situations would be and to maybe check someone's biases uh, or their blind spots about um, maybe moving too quickly or moving too slowly. It might even be, that might even be a helpful heuristic. You know, are you as a clinician a, a fast mover? Are you fast to deviate or are you slow to deviate, right? And, and maybe the corrections need to be made depending on where one might be at there. Um, com 
and finally, communicating best practices with one another, with researchers. For all I know, there's some really interesting stuff going on among in clinics and clinicians that are that are uh, um, doing some interesting group-based, evidence-based treatment. Um, but I'm not sure how how good of a network we we we, we have in in doing that. So I'd be open to other ideas or, or thoughts about this. So just um, real quick in in, in closing. Um, my part here, and then we'll have a, some questions and discussion. Just some recommended resources. Um, there's the classic um, Irvin Yalom text. This isn't for substance use treatment specifically, but it goes over kind of some of the basic principles of, of, of uh, at least a, a certain style of group therapy. Uh, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment has um, put out a, 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 a manual on group therapy that's available for free at this link. It's a nice overview of basic principles. The Stage 12 um, program, which I, I mentioned, this could be a great program to plug right into an intensive outpatient program, if, particularly if they're open to 12-step approaches. The manual is available for, for free um, here at this uh, link. A um, few other things, um, the Seeking Safety Manual, which has been designed and assessed with, with groups at least in mind. Um, Sobel and Sobel's uh, group therapy um, for substance use disorders, um, it combines motivational and CBT approaches. I really like this manual by Wenzel et al. in Group Cognitive Therapy for Addictions. It can be used with open or closed groups. You can kind of mix or match what you want um, within the, the context of whatever kind of group you're using. And then finally, um, uh, Wagner et al.'s Motivational Interviewing in Groups, um, which uh, outline some strategies for doing what may seem like a one-on-one -on -one process, motivational interviewing, how to make that work in a group process. I just have a few acknowledgments here. I, I, I won't go into these in detail, but some people who have helped me along the way and helped my research, there's some uh, funding acknowledgments here as well. And um, the references are here for, for, for your use. Um, let's open it up for questions and, and conversation. I see that there's some people who have already started chatting here. So uh, earlier, Dennis Daly commented about Sobel's recent book on group treatment reported on comparison of five group versus individual interventions for the same type of therapy, and they found that there was no difference in outcomes which showed group therapy as effective as individual. Yeah, yeah, th thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, um, that was an extension of, of, of Weiss's research um, from 2004, so basically it was a, a kind of an updated um, take on that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Mary Beth Leon um, uh, commended that uh, this was an honest assessment of what is happening in the field. Do you have an outline using CBT, mindfulness, motivational interviewing approaches, and maybe a 30-minute intro portion of a 90-minute group setting? Well, I, I think that the kind of thing that, that uh, Mary Beth is asking for is the kind of thing we need to create together. I wouldn't be surprised if this sort of thing exists. Now, wh what, um, what I would recommend um, off the top of my head for, for, this, sort of, um, for this sort of thing um, is, the, is the manual I mentioned here by, uh, on slide 27 by Wenzel et al. This is for CBT anyway, in which you could very easily use some of those techniques in in a in a portion of a group, and if I if I were to point somebody for one thing that I think would be the easiest to use that exists right now, it would be that. But I think a lot of work needs to be done in that regard. I hope I'm answering that. Um, she continued that um, they actually use a model where the doctor, the provider uh, of Suboxone, uh, and the social worker run the weekly 90-minute group, and then clients highly value the presence of their doctor knowing them well and on their side in the process, the journey to their recovery. So, yeah. so thanks for sharing that, Mary Beth. Um, and then Dennis Daly, uh, someone who uh, speaks on, uh, you know, mental health issues with, with, with the CTN, um, and uh, he commented that nicely presented. So uh, thank you, Dennis, for, for that feedback. A few comments. One, clients like therapy groups that focus on problem solving, coping skills, in addition to PE recovery groups. Um, the second is that group leaders often do not get supervision or consultation. Group leaders often conduct multiple groups per week, five to ten, 
plus sessions, which can lead to boredom and burnout, um, can be quite overwhelming. And then patients complain that they get too much group and then no or very little one-on-one sessions. A combo, you know, tends to work better. And then we found regular meetings of group leaders to discuss group issues, usually more process-focused than the content. But we developed a group template that can help this process, and we'd be glad to uh, have you share some of that, Dennis. Group leaders sometimes need a break from groups to even recharge themselves. Well, that, thank, you, thank you for that, Dennis. And, and, and for those who aren't aware, you know, Dennis Daly is, is a, truly one of the experts in, in, in thinking about group therapy and in some of the research done in group therapy for substance use treatment. And I think that's a lot of great stuff to think about there. Um, I, I, I really like the idea of having some sort of having some sort of a way in which group facilitators can kind of process groups together. And, and I know that that's something that is, is, is more commonly used in certain kinds of treatment. For example, like a DBT may be more likely to have like a group of like clinicians that talk about things. And I think that could be a really actually great thing um, that, that maybe could be feasible. Maybe even if, it's, even if it's an hour a month, right, in which you had a group that, that uh, of the facilitators that got together and that that could itself even be a kind of group, right, at some level, right, and, and in which certain group therapy facilitation skills could be even modeled by some of the more skillful people in the very context of that, right? Maybe you could have your group therapy gurus um, who, could, who could lead that group, right? I think there's a, there's a lot of things that, to, 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 think, to think about there. And this point about boredom, I think, is important, too. I think that it's very common for, for clinicians to kind of want to go off and do their own thing just because they're bored. And so, and, and, and that's where I think it, another reason for why flexibility is important as well, and that if clinicians generally, we have to think about more than just treatment fidelity, right? We have to think about long-term feasibility. And this is already a high burnout field. So whatever we can do to help clinicians have high job satisfaction is probably in the long run going to help us in, in, in this work. Okay. Um, Eve Jellstrom, go ahead. Hi, Dennis. That was very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, in doing your research, uh, when you were doing your survey research, <clears throat> were you doing a national survey so you saw more than just your local free sites in that data? The, the survey, which I, which I didn't present here, I mentioned it a, a little bit. Um, it was it was a it, it wasn't it was a national survey, but not a like a really um, wasn't meant to be necessarily nationally representative. It was basically mm -hmm. through uh, through NADAC, um, NAADAC, which is the largest treatment or professional organization of substance use counselors. Um, so so okay. that survey did get get a, um, a a bit of I think more representative information about a number of things. And um, I'd be happy to, to, to share that with, with uh, you if, if you want to send me an email. I can share you what I have on that right now. Please. Okay. I, I was just curious, um, you, know, uh, where, you know, how you got some of your information. So that, that's great. It was just very interesting to hear the, the plans of how things are supposed to be done and then in actuality, I mean, what people are trained on and then how, what they're asked to do when they get out in the real world. Right. Um, my name is Ms. Sullivan. I want to ask, with this study that you did um, in reference to the groups, um, did you, you, uh, uh, were any clients that um, attended methadone programs, were they, did they participate in that study? Right. So the, um, the, this qualitative portion that I, that I presented was not with methadone clients. It, it was, however, with did include um, the two of the clinics did have um, a number of uh, suboxone um, provided suboxone um, patient or uh, suboxone uh, medication. Um, however, the survey that um, did include a lot of methadone programs. Um, and one thing that stood out from the survey actually was that um, there was a, there was a fair bit of. Um, Using groups for med for talking about medication and medication adherence among methadone programs, but but most of what I've talked about here, it, it, I, I acknowledge that it could be quite a different um, animal thinking about maybe some of those different kinds of programs. Mm 
David LeBron made the comment that uh, L- NLP training can be very valuable as a strong basis for the facilitator approach to manage group processing of EBT. Yeah, I'm not familiar with what NLP is. Uh, it's neural linguistic programming, uh, which is uh, sort of the cutting edge of uh, the psychology of communication. It, it deals with the repertory, uh, representatory uh, systems that we have, you know, kinesthetic, auditory, and, uh, and, and visual. And uh, when I'm doing, uh, I'm processing, well, I'm in group therapy, I notice that, you know, people, uh, their response, their physicality uh, also influences uh, their behavior or their comments at the time. And it's kind of instru- instrumental. And I even do that and uh, uh, use that technique within, uh, in counseling sessions, private sessions as well. So it's just something that helped me uh, sort of to uh, meet people where they're at <laughs> by observation. Yeah, thank you. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but yeah, it's something to, to look into. Yes, sir. I, I noticed um, there was a comment here about uh, from Christopher Engel um, saying, addressing your point about group as therapy versus group as a vehicle, doesn't the concept of manualized treatment itself contribute to this issue? When a clinician focuses on a manualized curriculum, it appears to me they are sacrificing focus on group process where the real healing and growth occurs. I mean, I think that's an excellent comment. I think it's something we need to really reckon with. My, my, my answer would be a manualized treatment could, or at least the way that it's thought about, right? And if, we, if we're thinking about a manualized therapy as being the transportability of educational content, then yeah, it probably would contribute to that issue. However, I think we could think about something that could be manualized in a lighter sense that, that would have some, some, some basic structures that could be, could, um, people could build off of. That um, that could allow for that balance, and I think it's that that balance that 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 I would certainly advocate for, and that I that would be what to try to to to, to shoot for. There it looks like a Mary Beth uh, Leon had a comment here. Um, with the high rate of relapse, do you have any experience with tapering folks down to two milligrams of Suboxone for the long term with reduced counseling requirements? Yeah, that's that's beyond my pay grade. Maybe someone else can speak to it, but that's just something that the, the medication-related aspects is something that I haven't studied and can't really speak to. Sorry. sorry. Can, can I address um, this uh, comment by Kezia here? Sure. Um, she, um, Kezia mentioned that, you know, that group therapy can become very redundant. Um, and I think that that's another challenge here. And uh, One challenge is particularly, for example, in doing group therapy with open groups, is that some redundancy almost has to be there, right, in order to, in order to, you know, address that somebody new is coming all the time. So how do you do that in a way that's not dull, that's not boring, right? And, and that, 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 that I think can be a challenge because somebody may really need that content if they're new, but the people who have been around for a while are really getting bored. Um, what I've seen some people do that I think is more helpful is by having the group members who have been around longer actually be the ones who are doing the review, right? And so, so by having others involved in the, in the teaching of content or in bringing someone else up to speed can help it be less redundant and a little more engaging, I would say. I just wanted to just address one idea for that. Okay. Well, that will close out our Q&A session. We're at the top of the hour. Dennis, this has been great. We've had a lot of um, participation with this, which we really encourage during our webinar. So thank you so much for uh, delivering this presentation in such a very organized and, and innovative way. And, and the recommendations were great as well. Yeah, th- thank you. Thank- and thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm just putting here in the chat here my, my email address. I'd be happy if you, anybody has any comments or questions or, or ideas or resources. I would be very happy to, 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 to hear from you or to, or to chat more. Right. Thanks so much. And here's the um, the link that where we'll post in about 10 days the recording and also the handout. Um, those, the handout was sent out before the presentation, but for those who did not get in and registered early enough, we'll, we'll post them there for you to have it. So thank you for coming. Um, we invite everyone back next month on April 20th for the CTN Investigator Toolbox uh, Orientation, where Deepla Bloomberg from the CCC and Carmen's 
Rosa from NIDA will talk about um, the tools and, and uh, resources that are made available to our investigators who are conducting our CT and clinical trials. So thank you so much. Um, this will end our presentation, and we will see you next month. Thanks, Dennis, for coming. <laughs>